mind bend. Non ordinary and extraordinary states of consciousness for a mind bend creative. Do you hate social media, Leonard Smith Jr.? Um, I hate. I hate. Do you psychology. Hate? I hate this. I do hate. I am do known hate? as a hater. Are you hateful? I, I, I'm not hateful, but I, I am a very honest person. And sometimes that can be seen as hate. And, uh, you know, but with social media, I, I hate the psychology behind it. I hate the the way people treat it and the way it affects people in their minds. And um, even though I am a stand up comedian, I don't want attention. I don't. I don't, you don't need to see a picture of my face every day. Um, I, I was just telling you right before we started recording that I am on there more because I had to humble myself. I had to get over it. I'm a stand up comedian. I have to use social media. I have to promote myself. That's the way it is now. So, mainly with me and me being a comedian, you would think I would have views and thoughts that I think people need to hear. Mm -hmm. That's not me at all. That's not my style. Mm -hmm. That's not the type of comedian I am. Mm -hmm. So as far as social media goes, it's just me showing people what I'm doing. I want them to be able to access the stuff that I have that I'm putting out and come to my shows. Mm -hmm. And if I see something funny, I'm going to put up something funny. And, and if there's something that upsets me that I feel like I really need to let people know, maybe that. And also just promoting my friends and posting their stuff. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's an aspect of the field that I'm in that I, I, I can't ignore it. And mm -hmm. I tried to ignore it. And I, you know, I felt morally superior to other people because I was like, I don't need social media. Mm -hmm. I don't. That's not me. Mm -hmm. I don't. But it's like, who cares? You know, and also I'm never going to judge anyone who loves social media. If you do you, then you do you, mm -hmm. you know. But and you said morally superior, and I appreciate that you're ready to cut yourself down. But I think you might be morally superior oh. if you don't enjoy social media. Yeah, for sure. And as humans, to get through this life, and especially the world that we live in today, you have to feel more. It's since the beginning of time, humans have had to feel superior to someone to keep it to keep going, to make it through the day. I there's you find you find reasons. Oh my nationality or the the country that i'm from or you f you have to find something to feel morally superior and it, it might be subconscious oh. it might be more forefront in your in your brain but you don't even realize it what is moral again what's a moral what is moral did you see election yes. i thought it was really yeah, good yeah no it is a good movie it's yeah. a very good movie but I, he was talking about morality versus ethics what is morality what what con what does morality conjure for you death <laughs> Like we're that's mortality. Mortality. Oh yeah, I'm tripping. <laughs> I'm sorry, I smoked a little right before the death. <laughs> no, but I guess there are aspects of morality involved in the consideration of mortality. Well, here you go. When it comes to morality, I I feel like I got very good morals from Christianity as a child, and then I saw the hypocrisy of it, and I kind of stepped away from it Same. and I stopped. But the morals that I have is, I just try to respect people the way I want to be respected and treat people the way I want to be treated, and when it comes to morals, I feel like my even though I'm such a hater, I don't truly be like in the moment I'm like, what are you doing? But you're a massive lover is the thing. I, I know you're a massive yeah, lover. I am a big lover. And that's I, why that's why we have a problem. Yeah. See, I, I, I think that we're being I think that we're being conned. And then when you see somebody that you love being taken advantage of, you want to react, right? And you don't want to support that behavior. I think we're being entranced. I think we've been charmed away from ourselves into a characterization of being a contemporary human being that's expressed through social media. Oh my and, God. and I think that it's become such an integral part through addiction. We live in an addiction culture. Uh, so <laughs> We have been conditioned into this thought of addiction and that it's normal mm. with the pharmaceutical industry. Ever since I was a child, I was a very cynical child. Um, hmm. I was all alone a lot, so I had a lot of thoughts to myself. You know, because your because uh, your parents are working. Or? Parents are working. I always lived in a single parent household. Um, I lived with my mom for like the first twelve years, and then I lived with my dad from like thirteen to eighteen. And I had a, I have an older sister, but she's like nine years older, and she moved out when she was sixteen. So I was kind of like an only child, hmm. basically. And you know, as a child, I realized the hypocrisy of Christianity. I was just like. My family didn't go to church. I would go to church with my neighbors. Like mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a very Christian town, mm -hmm. Lynchburg, Virginia, home of the Fallwells, Liberty University. It was all about being Christian. 
Well, what a pedigree. Yeah, and at 11 years old, I was just like, what? What is this? What am I doing? And I, I was seeing things, and I, you know, before we were really conditioned into this, we've always been conditioned since media and TV have come out and newspapers. They're, they've always found a way to try to to change our, our thought process. But as a kid, I I went to like a a, a smart kid school, so I, I was able to be a free thinker. Did you get bust away? To I got bust away. I I went to this one school. They made me take a taste test. Oh, now you're going to this new school with just like 60 students got busted to this new school. So I was a free thinker as a, to me as a kid. And I, I realized the hypocrisy of Christianity. And then I just became such a cynic. I was just a cynical person. I never understood why there were commercials for phar- pharmaceutical drugs. Why am I seeing ads in a magazine? Why am I seeing commercials? As a kid? As a kid, I felt that way. And I just hated it. So I've never done Xanax. I've never done Percocets. I've never done like, I partied a lot during my 20s partied hard, went crazy, but I always knew I'm a big believer in energy. I believe in energy and positive energy. There's a balance for everything. So pills, it just, it's just bad. There's this negative energy. And I feel like in the black community, there is this stigma of that psychedelics are bad. You know, they like in the black community specifically. Oh, I mean, I feel like a lot of communities, but I feel like in the black community, they're like, sure, man, I ain't fuck with that nigga. Like, what are you doing? Like, Acid, like I'm not like, it's like they would, you know, other, other, no drugs are really okay, but there's just a weird stigma I feel like with psychedelics in the black community. At least that's what I've, I've experienced. Yeah, like, it's just like, they'll do lean, they'll do this, but they won't. I'm not going to take fucking shrooms, but I feel like now it's more of a, it's more acceptable. And, you know, that's why I'm happy I can come over here and talk what about it. What is it? What's with that stigma? Where did it come from? Because I, because we have a couple of, things to point to but i don't really know so and and it's it's amazing to hear it coming from you that that's something that you've encountered yeah um and it's one thing that we're trying to address because as as we're out there gathering content for what we do we don't find a lot of black voices talking about their embrace of psychedelics and most of the events that i go to there aren't a lot of black faces there yeah um and why do you think that is well i want to hear it from you why do you think it is you know i i personally can't say for the whole black community why it is but in my experience i feel like when you think of psychedelics you think of trippy hippie white people and i don't know because those are the images that we see of hey ashbury it's a lot of white kids exactly long hair. it's yeah. what we saw on tv yeah. it's what we saw in the magazines it's what we saw in movies and it's like you don't see black people in those spaces so it's like i don't know if it was marketed to black people me being the person that i am cynical it's also like I feel like they didn't want black people taking psychedelics, man. I don't know who they are, right. but like they is always the big question. Yeah, but like as a as a the first time I took shrooms, I was like 19 years old, I think. And I was a little worried about it, but then I really thought about it. I was like, shrooms are from the earth, man. People are taking this shit like I was one of those, oh, it's from the earth, which I mean it's better than some man-made labs. Whatever shit. you're snorting, yeah. wherever the fuck it came exactly. from. Exactly. And I, I, I had friends trying it. I was a big pothead. I had moved to Atlanta, and then I started smoking weed, and I just really, you know, just went all in. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to experience this. And I think maybe it was just the friends that I had around me and that everyone was willing to try it. There was just a different energy with it. And I I loved it. I thought it was great. I, I feel like they maybe... The day that I was talking about is I realized my mind was opened up so much, like from taking these shrooms, there were things that were like I had been repressing and, and, and well, you're uh, an introspective person. How, very, how were you repressing? Things? Okay. So I am a very introspective person, but I also compartmentalize a lot, like a lot of things and in and, and the ways like I don't want, I know how fucked up the world is. So I just don't want to think about it. And I don't, I don't. I am in, I'm in therapy right now. I've been in therapy for a couple of years. And one of my issues is maybe from disappointments and being in a, a single parent household and, and my parents have to work and just being alone. You can, I was let down a lot, you know? So mm-hmm. I, as to combat that, I kind of made it to where like, fuck it. I don't, I don't care. Mm-hmm. So if you don't fuck with me, then I don't fuck with you. It's cool. And, and not like, I hate you. It's just like, all right, I'm not thinking about you anymore. You're that mm-hmm. plant in the corner of the room. You're just there and 
you're not gonna I truly don't let other people's energy affect me but I I, I protected myself so much that now it, it it's like harder for me to enjoy things because it's mm. like I'm never too high and I'm never too low mm-hmm. so um I don't even remember where I started to get there but uh you know this so we're talking about the stigma of psychedelics the in stigma particular. of psychedelics yeah, okay. and it's just that like Parts of your mind that you maybe don't want to access or you had forgotten about or you weren't ready to access, those things, if you take enough shrooms, those things will come up and you will think about them. And I didn't know about the um, the medical aspects or any scientific trials at the time when I was taking shrooms. No way. Nobody does. Yeah. And I was taking them a lot. I used to sell them. I, I used to sell a lot of weed. I used to sell shrooms and like... Cause I was like, I love weed, man. Like it, this shit shouldn't be illegal. And like, I am poor. <laughs> so uh, I'm very like socially blessed and know people. So like, that's how I made it through my twenties. But every time I was taking shrooms, it was like, I would, there would be an epiphany. I would, there would be a moment in the trip where I was just like, fuck. This is a macro dose yes. by yourself. Uh, usually with people, normally with people, sometimes by myself. I I would I would take shrooms and like go to a party. Like I, there was a point in my life where I was taking a lot of shrooms. And um but there were times though where you know I was just at my house with my friends, let's all take shrooms. All right, I'm going to go in a room by myself. There was one specific trip in 2010 that I had where I was tripping, went to a party or whatever get dropped off back at home and my roommate, her and some people are talking on the front porch and I'm just laying in the couch in the living room and I can hear them talking on the front porch. And I was just listening to them, like really listening just hearing them speak and how they were interacting with each other. And I felt so morally superior in the moment. I was like, this is so superficial, like all of this. And ever since- You mean they were just kibitzing and shooting the shit and it was just lowbrow. And it was, but it was, but it was just like, Almost like they just wanted to hear themselves talk. Uh, yeah. And it almost felt like me, my feelings towards social media right now, maybe. just It was just like, I just was like, what is the point of just spewing out garbage just to spew out garbage, just to like, huh? and I, I think in that moment, I was just like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to subscribe to just like, having to be hurt, you know, like I was in my twenties and you know how you're in your twenties and you're young and everybody just wants manifesto. To, yeah. And ever since then, I, I am a really loving and can be a very open person, but it now it's like, I will only allow access to that mm-hmm. after I, I like, I, I hate small talk. I hate bullshit conversations. Mm-hmm. So if we're going to talk, we'll talk about something real. If we're not going to talk, and I'm probably just going to, I am comfortable just sitting, sitting there in a room with someone and not speaking. Totally. I don't have to, I don't have to voice anything to you. I, I mm-hmm. If you want to talk to me and you want to voice something to me, then fine. I think it's just growing up in this very Christian town and the forcing of Christianity onto people. I just hate the thought of forcing ideas onto other people. Totally. Yeah, I, I really began to take issue with uh, all of the hypocritical behavior in the Catholic school that I went to and watching how the teachers treated people and the students treat each other. You know, I was isolated as a nerd from kindergarten through eighth grade, and I stayed that way the whole time, but there were kids that had it much rougher than me. And um, the hypocrisy there was absurd to me. I understood that way too early. The way that teachers treated people was ridiculous. Um, and the book of Exodus was insane. I'll continue to defend your stance of moral superior. I think you're poo-pooing, because <laughs> your love is so robust, you're poo-pooing your sense of it. You're calling it moral superiority because that's what the rest of the culture would like see you okay. as as exhibiting, right? Okay. But like, just like you, you have problems with religion because you know it doesn't maximize human potential, and it's not there to maximize human potential, really. It's there to, to police be, us. It's there to be controlling and to mm, be yeah. policed, and right. Uh, and at its best, at its best, you and I can take away things. When I had my first uh, confession, when I was in what second or third grade, I thought I was like filled with the Holy Spirit. I was flush with the Holy Spirit. I, I walked out of the confessional saying I made fun of my sister or I stole my brother's toys, 
And I was filled with like an electric energy. It's like a very like powerful moment. Yeah. Same thing with my first communion. And that's the power of the mind, you know? Like I believed it and I felt it, right? I want to talk about psychedelic, the term mind manifesting. I can't imagine a vocational choice that's more mind manifesting immediately than being a comedian. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on up here. So yeah. I mean, it's uh, taking your mind and it's like and, and, and spitting and, it out and, so and other people creating something. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, I feel like a lot of things are mind manifesting. When I look at art, I'm just like, maybe that's how people feel with my stand-up comedy. When I see somebody, an artist painting something, I'm like, I'm just so entranced in the action and how they can when they start and what it ends up being, and knowing that they had that image in their mind mm. and. As a comic, there's so many things running through my mind, and it, I'm a, a comic where I kind of just go like weird places in my head. Because as a child, I daydreamed a lot, and I kind of uh, got over that. I'm not really a dreamer anymore. Maybe I should be again, but um, you replaced it with tripping. <laughs> with tri oh yeah, with a lot of tripping. Why are and, you tripping so much? Um. I didn't know about maybe therapy or had access to therapy. Uh, what, what was it? Was it uh, trying to check out? What were well, trying to you change? Know, my twenties, I I partied a really hard. I, I I drank a lot. I smoked a lot. Like I don't drink anymore. Like I I still drink. Like I'm a comic. Like I have a drink or two uh, to be social only in social settings. But back then I was drinking every single night. Oh, I, I smoke weed every day. Uh, <laughs> I smoke weed every day. Uh, I've been doing that since I was like basically a teen, 18. Um, I think it was just, I was a law. I didn't know where I belonged. You know, I never really had a, a, a sense of, um, from a family, a true family. Uh, like you said, you were like a nerd. I, I, I uh, found out that I was smart as a young kid, and they shipped me off. So it was like all my family that lived in the country were like, "Oh, why do you talk white? Like, why do you do this?" So it was like I'm my extended family. I wasn't really accepted by because we lived in the city, and I was uh, going to school with nothing but white people, and so I never really got accepted from them. And then my family, there's no ill will, there's no malcontent. It's just like maybe indifference. And you know, as I'm getting older and going to therapy, it's like, all right, you know, I'm connecting more with my family. I am a lot closer with my father and my, and my sister now than mm -hmm. I've ever been in my life. But I, I uh, man, I'm such a stoner, man. <laughs> I'm such a stoner. I'm such a stoner. It's part I'm of sorry. the magic. I'm sorry. Where, what, what, is, what does cannabis do for you? I think cannabis is basically like my Xanax or something. I don't know. Like I am not an anxious person. I don't have anxiety and I've always felt really good about that. But then I also realized I smoke weed every single day. <laughs> so and you've done that for a long time. For a long time. Yeah. I think, I think the reason why I was tripping so much in my twenties was, and, and partying so much was just, it was an escape. It was, I was trying to fill a void, but with the shrooms, I realized how how beneficial it was and how like good for me it was. And then the more I took shrooms, the more it became like, all right, I need to take these shrooms right now. Or, or I, I, I don't know what the science is behind this, but in my mind, maybe it was because I didn't want to face some things, but I was like, people were like, Oh yeah, you want to trip this uh, weekend? I was like, no, nah, I'm not in the right place to trip right now. Like I, I'm not ready to, to, to face these things that are going to happen because I always macro dosed whenever I took shrooms. So, um, how much was that? Uh, how did you know? How did you know how much you were doing? What was a macro? Oh, I had, you a, were, I had were a you scale. measuring it. Okay, I had you a scale. Right. Oh yeah, I was, yeah, I had or a scale. You had the lab coat yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, the I, there. You know, I would do. I don't know if this is a lot, but I would do like at a point. Like I think the most I was doing at the time was like seven grams or like you That's know, a lot. yeah, like I would eat at least an eighth. I couldn't eat if I was there. Was, I was like, what's the point of eating under an eighth? You know, I'm, I'm trying to trip, trip. So, um, it, it, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was fun. It was an escape, but then it, then it turned into, as far as the psychedelics went into something like medicinal, like maybe even therapeutic. We're like, all right, I, I need to take these shrooms and I need to 
figure out what the fuck is going on. But that on. evolved for you naturally over time. Yeah, it was After it, usage. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Because exactly. I think that the, the reason why a lot of people come to them in the first place is to ha change up their experience, do something wild. Same reason why you go get drunk, right? You exactly. Spend, you know, maybe a person spends the whole week not drinking, and then on the weekend they binge drink to throw things into a different dimension, right? And change the way you act and change your perceptions and the way you carry yourself. Uh, I worry about... I worry about diversions like that. I worry about the, the checking out of substance, you know, because I feel like most of the ignorant violence that we see in the world is due to checking out, like spiritually, I, socially. I, right? I work at a bar. <laughs> I see yeah, it every well, day. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm nine years sober and I have a pretty pretty wicked feeling about alcohol in general. Um, I kind of wish it would just go away entirely. But when I go to a conference and I hear a lot of people running around talking about their love of the medicine, and then I go to after parties and I see everybody's on the medicine, it just doesn't work. There's some cognitive like dissonance in it for me. I'm like, medicine? I mean, medicine, medicine entails, okay, you use it only when you need it. Yeah. That's kind of one of the main connotations for me with medicine. But you're using pot every day. And, and how do you identify? It's not a matter of necessarily whether you need it, but it's if you want to. So wanting, met, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just kind of a weird mashup. Yeah. I, I don't know if I personally consider weed a medicine. It probably is for me. Maybe it's a vice, you know. Um, I, 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 I have now been... It's for sure an addiction, you know. I, I, but people I, always I, talk about how weed is not addictive, though. Yeah. Specifically, you hear that all the time. Well, the fact that I smoke weed before I do anything, that means I, it's like in my mind, I feel like I have to. And if I'm somewhere and I don't have, like, weed on me, I I, I get anxiety. It's like friends that spend the night at my house. I don't have coffee. I don't drink coffee. I don't so drink they coffee freak either. Out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> yeah, freak and, out, and, though, and, and, and that's an coffee. addiction. Dr yeah. People, everyone has these coffee addictions. And, and, and the alcohol... Yeah, man. I feel like maybe it is a medicine because a lot of people are just trying to escape this world that we live in. You could self-qualify yes. your behavior with pot, with cannabis, as you call it an addiction, but you don't think of it like most people would think of as an addiction. Whereas I think addiction yeah. implies once the substance stops being administered, there are negative side effects. Okay. And I think in your case, like mine is maybe just ritualistic. It's a ritual. I don't well, know. you said like if you don't have it, you know, you're you're yeah. you're not in good shape or whatever. I mean, could yeah. you go out and have a productive day if you're not smoking? Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. Okay, especially if I'm busy, I'm not thinking about it. But if I'm, that's probably be, what it means then. Yeah, if, I, if there's a moment and I'm out, I'm just like, oh, I don't have it. In that moment, I'm like, oh man, and then I, uh, you know, I keep it moving. Um, I just, uh, you know, I just want to say uh, I appreciate you having me on the podcast because, you know, these aren't I like I said, I am not a person who really has these in-depth conversations with people because uh -huh. I am such a cynic. I'm, I was a, I'm a nihilist kind of where I was just what's the point? You know, what's the point? But of course, thank you for being here and thank you for engaging with me. And my hope is always that anybody who's like watching or listening to this may be inclined to visit some of these concepts themselves, whether they're on a bike ride or walking to the grocery store or talking with friends or whatever, just making space to have those conversations that, that we may not have felt comfortable or encouraged to have as kids because it wasn't popular, whether our families thought we were the wrong race or whether our yeah. friends thought we were the wrong kind of nerdy or whatever, you know? What, what's it like to be a a, a, a comic in Los Angeles. What's it? What's it like to work here and be a comedian? What's okay. the scene like? What's your process like? Why? Why? Are you, why do you keep doing it? Uh, one thing about stand-up comedy that I uh, that I we were just talking about with social media, and I have an issue with being a, a older person is I'm so worried about people just taking my content and doing whatever they want with it mm. online. I don't like the thought of that. I don't like the thought of some person doing a voiceover of my voice and and getting views from it and not acknowledging me. It's all about respect. Are we talking about cryptocurrency now? <laughs> I've never fucked with cryptocurrency. Um, NFTs, how do you get how do you get credit for when somebody uses your intellectual property? Uh, you don't. And uh, I wasn't putting myself out there. I wasn't putting my stuff online maybe because I was worried about how it was going to be received and that the fact that it is now public domain and anybody can do whatever they want. As a stand-up comic, it's hard. You're you're working on these jokes. And hopefully these jokes will get you paid. You're sitting you know, at home with a pen and a paper and you're writing stuff down? Like song <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, my process. So my process is a lot of my premises and thoughts come to me at like 1.32 in the morning right before I'm about to go to sleep. 
So what I'll do is I'll uh, a thought process. I am more of like a guy who has like a lot of bits and I tell, I'm not a storyteller, but I like, I'm not a necessarily a uh, set up punchline, set up punchline, set up punchline, just telling you jokes. There are jokes within my bits, but you know, I just, I have so many just notes, notes where I just write down thoughts and then I start adding more to it and I start, and sometimes I'll just write out things and I'm like, this can never be a joke, but I might find little tidbits in there. It's a, it's a different process on the idea that I'm getting in the moment. Sometimes I'll just write down a thought, like literally a line. Like uh, <laughs> I was about to go to sleep and I, I am a very, like you said, introspective person and I, uh, introspective person. And I've been that way my entire life. So I do everything in my head, really. I, writing things down with a piece of pen and a paper, I cannot do because then it becomes too like robotic. It feels too, it doesn't feel as genuine hmm. with me. So I will come up with these ideas. I might find a punchline. I might find a setup. I might find a premise or whatever. And then I go do mics and I work it out on stage and I figure things out on stage. And there are a lot of comics who do that way. There are a lot of comics who just write jokes. And sometimes I have my mics and I get ideas and I'll write them down. But I find a lot of, I'll find punchlines on stage. I'll find tags on stage at mics. And uh, through that process, uh, I, I, that's what I like to do. And being a stand-up comic in L.A. is, it's interesting. If you're coming How long have you been out here? Six years. So if you're coming out to L.A., that first year, man, just make it that first year. Just try to survive if you're broke. If, you don't, if you're out here and you're broke, just get a job and pay your rent for the first year that you live here. Don't get fucking headshots. Don't go do, you don't need to do all that shit. Just survive that first year. That's my advice. Um, I was here for like maybe six months. I started doing mics. I started, the open mic scene is a little bit different than when I first came out here. It used to be like bucket mics and the first people to get here, you sign up. Um, now it's a, because of COVID, it's like slotted. And now you pay like five bucks for your slot, but it's like, you know, when you're going, you know, you're on this mic and you're good to go. So I, I do uh, appreciate that. But when I first came out here, I didn't know many people. I didn't know any, like, I knew like no people. Mm -hmm. And the stand up scene, I have an issue with it. You know, I mean, people, all people suck. <laughs> Everyone sucks in every field. Uh, you have to deal with shitty people, but in stand up, there's a lot of people who are really into themselves and who are really, who are on all the time. They're always on and they're just like, there are people who just want to use you. And so we're all trying to get on stage. We're all trying to be seen as stand up comics. So some people can let that, um, like you said, like with, with anything they can, they can abuse that. And it's a little really clicky, you know, people are really, you know, so if you don't know people, the scene can be a little depressing. Because you go to if you go to certain mics, if you go to the wrong mics, you're like just seeing people on stage sometimes just spew just trash. You mean Negative. it's just not quality or or equality as in it's not quality and sometimes just misogynistic things, racist uh, yeah. things, and it's like I don't want to have to sit through this, but you have to. And it's like like I said, I believe in energy. It's like you're putting that negative energy into my life, into my space, and I don't want that. And through doing that and me like getting out of this long-term relationship in the place that I was in, it was just really depressing. And I was just really depressed and I stopped doing stand up. And I was just like, fuck this. I was doing other comedy. I was doing sketch comedy. Then I started doing improv and I fell in love with improv. Oh. The improv community is just a really, they're like, I'm a, I'm such a hater. They're like too nice. You know, they're just like, everyone's just so sweet. <laughs> and it's just like white college positive energy like everybody it's it's a very i feel like distinct scene and uh i'm very happy that i got involved and got to um help uh with the diversity of the scene mm -hmm. um I, I fell in love with it i came to it very uh quickly and very easily like i said i do everything in my head i used to rap so it's like when i used to rap and create songs that's improv uh, it's it's improv when i used to rap and create songs i would hear the beat and, you know, some people are writers. They already have notebooks of rhymes and, and verses, and then they put that to a beat. I would listen to the beat, and then i just freestyle bar after bar. I might get four bars. I might get two bars. Then i just go back, start the track over, freestyle it, and then i 
would remember it all in my head and then I'd just record the audio. There's something about pen and paper that I just don't like. I'm an audio, auditory, visual learner. It's how I uh, learn and experience things. It's probably why I love stand-up comedy so much. It's Mm -hmm. like I'm seeing it, I'm hearing it, and I can truly feel it. And so that's always been my process even with rap and with, with comedy. It's just like saying it out and working it out, out loud, where I can hear myself saying it. And which is funny because I hate hearing myself. And I hate hearing myself speak. <laughs> I'm, I love to listen. I'm a big listener. And I feel, honestly, I feel kind of weird now talking as much as I've been talking. Uh, your voice sounds cool. Yeah, I used to hate my voice. I used to hate my voice, but now I like it. I like my voice Okay, now. so you yeah. can listen to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can listen to this. Oh, well, I'm a comic now. I have to, once, a weird thing about me is um, I knew since eighth grade that I wanted to be a stand-up comic. Mm. I, I I was a child, I did theater, and I was like, oh, I want to be an actor. And then I went to my friend Sam Rogers' house in eighth grade. They had HBO, and, and I you did a half ounce of mushrooms and you watched <laughs> oh, yeah. the we, Bobcat we Goldthwait special. Oh my God, Bobcat! I actually watched Killing Them Softly, Dave Chappelle's special, and I was like, that's what I want to do. That's that's what I'm supposed to do, and uh. As I got older and 18, I was like getting close to high school. I was like, okay, I want to be a stand-up comic. But every stand-up comic that I've seen that has been great and that I love has been older. And moving from Lynchburg to Atlanta at 14, I realized I didn't know shit about shit. And I never really thought I did. But I was like, I know nothing, Jon Snow. And um, I told myself I wouldn't do stand-up comedy until I turned 30 years old. (laughs) <laughs> hmm. I was like, I need to live life. I need experiences. Holy cow. And I'll 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 do stand up when I turn 30. I don't know if it was hindsight, like I was it was wisdom, or if it was me being scared uh and being a pussy, but maybe it was a little bit of all of that. But uh, I moved out here when I was 29 and I was like, all right, I'm doing stand here, you know, a year earlier. So So you you adhered to your uh your vision. Yeah. And between the times I found ways to get on stage and, and like the the thing with me is I like making people happy. Yeah. <laughs> I like bringing people joy. Yeah. I like making people laugh. I like making people smile. Yeah. And I like seeing that. I like being in that room and feeling the energy, which yeah. is why I don't care about being funny on social media, which is why I don't care about being yeah. funny. Because that's online. not your zone. It's not my zone. Yeah. I like being in that room and feeling those laughs and feeling that energy and feeling the joy. It brings me joy. It, it might be selfish of me. You know, it's like I feel good when I'm doing that. I need a definite definition from you. Once and for all, clear this up for me. Okay. What the fuck is energy? What is energy? I hear it about it a lot. I took the Reiki classes. I have my own idea of what energy is. Can you give me a definitive answer? I have never done any studying or delving into this topic or learning about it is just how I feel. And people get really upset with me about a lot of things. Cause I don't, I'm really bad at explaining myself and maybe um, vocalizing my feelings. But for me, everything is about feeling like it's all about feel with me and the feeling energy I think is, 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 is what you're, I don't know how to explain it. It's, I don't know if it's like some blessing or it's it's what I have it's what I've been gifted with through the cosmos through the stars through the in- but I am very um socially blessed I'm very good at like reading people and and feeling people and, and maybe I'm very empathetic as well um but the feeling energy is the feeling that I get when I'm around you when I'm around a person when I'm in an area Energy is what I am trying to make you feel like. I don't want to make anyone feel bad. Like I don't like, I think through like tripping and through like growing, I've learned that you have to, you have to feel good and you have to, you only have so much time on this earth. You want to feel good. You want to be happy, but you don't have to do that in detriment of other people. You can still, you can still be courteous and be kind and, and other people are going to be that way to you. They're, I don't know if it's karma. I don't. I, I don't. Karma is just. Is I don't think that's the right word. But it's just. I just put out the energy that I want to receive. And if, if you're out here being negative, and you're out here being, 
you know, uh, you know, uh, truly hateful or truly upset about things, then you're going to keep, that's not going to change. It's, it's really about your mindset. If like, I don't let, I think it's this going back to me protecting myself, but it's like, I, I try not to let negative things bother me too much. It's like, you, you have to experience the emotions. You cannot repress them. You have to experience these emotions, but you don't have to harp on them. You can be like, all right, I know this is fucked up, but, I'm going to try to face this and then look at the positive things that have come out of me facing this. And I just try to be, I just try to be nice to people and I try to uh, just treat people the way I want to be treated. And I try not to surround myself with people with bad energy. There are people with negative energy. There's this, there are people that I used to be friends with in the world that I was in with mm. selling weed and selling shrooms and rapping. There were, there were people who had definite negative energy. And when I was around those people, negative things happened. And I don't know if there is are bad people or good people, but there are people with bad intentions and bad thoughts. And maybe if you, try to let them know that they can go about with things in different ways and try to bring some positive energy in their life. You can, you can help them. And sometimes you, that might be the energy that you need, but sometimes like that, that might be the energy that they need and you might be that person for them, but sometimes you might not be, you might not, you might be a person for them to learn a lesson that they lost positive energy in their life because of the ways that they were being. Mm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I think you nailed it. <laughs> I think it was got all it. over the place. <laughs> we only have a few minutes left, but okay. I, I want to. Do you want to do some comedy? <laughs> do you want to do, do comedy right here? Um, I don't know. I would, um, I feel like I'm never funny on podcasts. I'm, do I, you want Leonard to do comedy? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'll give you my little quick little opening. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to laugh at anything. So, okay. So there's no confusion. Okay. That it, it's not because I didn't think it was funny. It's not oh well, you laugh. know things. You know, I'm a comic and I have a certain style and I, I like to be on stage. You know, I also like to criticize Obama in front of white women. <laughs> they never know how to react. <laughs> they never know. I'm taking that privilege back. Okay, it's mine now. Um, because you know these these white women had my head fucked up during the pandemic. A lot of things had my head fucked up during the pandemic. So I decided I wanted to learn something about myself. So I did a 23 and me. Yeah. I, I spent $200 to find out I was black. <laughs> now 23 and me knows I'm a 35 year old single African American male with no kids in the black community. They think I'm gay. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just poor kids can't afford them. We can abort them, but we cannot afford them. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just speaking my truth here. I'm just, I'm speaking my truth. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I had to, uh, there we go. There you go. I did a little something for you. I did there. some comedy. I did some comedy for you. For gracing us. <laughs> uh, I did the 23 Me recently too. And uh, yeah, I have blue eyes and a cleft chin. Uh, you have to pay extra money to find out when you're going to fall out of a hot air balloon on vacation in 50 years. They will not stop sending you emails. It is in I, fucking it, It's on my agenda today to, to wipe unsubscribe. out all of the 23andMe yeah. emails. Yeah. yeah, I did it to my doctor's office. I was really hoping I was going to find out the exact day, hour, and minute that I was going to get cancer. <laughs> and, I, and, and you have to pay an extra 150 bucks for that. Um, to clarify, I think everything can be done with intention, right? You can have a loving intention behind your actions or you can have some other kind of intention. Loving intentions are probably what we need on the planet most, maybe. And my concern is just, I think shitty things happen when we're checked out. That's the whole thing, you know? Whether we're checked out via our engagement with our social media apps, and we're not spending time with people that we love, or we're not spending time with our honest selves that aren't trying to impress everybody all the time, or whether we're checked out because we're smoked out, you know, to a point of being oblivious or whatever. I have a hard time reconciling 
the pursuit of social justice with binge drinking, you know, and all of the over drinking and all of the overindulgence that kind of goes with what everybody does. It's just like, well, there's, there's stuff to do. And maybe that's just it. Maybe we just get so exhausted from how fucking crazy everything feels. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in this to be pro the best possible outcome for people and I'm finding that I think there are incredible ways that we can talk about healing and transcendence through psychedelic augmentation and personalized medicine. But I also want to be able to talk about, hey, is this stuff like, are, are we using it skillfully? You know, are, are we framing our ideas around it in a skillful and, and loving way? And, um, you know, maybe that conversation is not always going to be the most popular or fun but I think, uh, like I said, I'll kind of die on that hill, like trying to establish the the ground for us to yeah to and chat I, that way. I appreciate you doing that because um, it it needs to be done, and anything that can help people have a better better life in this world and be more um, mentally stable is always good. You know, I, I think psychedelics is is a big I. I <sighs> I can't wait for these studies to truly come out and people to really find out the benefits uh, of psychedelics. And also, I, we just also need to just break that stigma. You know, just black people, you can take shrooms, man, and and, and do some do some research and, and see what you feel comfortable with and, and what you like. And also therapy, man. Therapy is also very beneficial. And there are no black therapists either. I have a black therapist. To. Shout out to my black therapist, uh, my male black therapist, Jeff, man. He's great. Love him. Um... There was something else I want to say, but I forgot. It's oh, okay. well, when you come back, I, I want to talk more about the stigma of psychedelics in the black community specifically. Obviously, you can't talk for everybody who's black, but you can talk to your experience and why people have had an aversion to trying psychedelics, right? And then I also want to talk about who the they is, the they behind who is it that didn't want people doing whatever in 1968 and who doesn't want people doing it now and what the vested interests are. We'll, we'll figure it out, Leonard. I think you and I will figure it out together. Ooh. This will be fun. I'm going to, I'm going to go down some, I'm going to go do some research and go down some holes and this will be fun. All right. We'll, we'll do it about. again. Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming out. Hey, thanks for having me. Man. You got it. Yeah.